Um, there is a research brief. Thank you, Laura, for starting the recording. There is a research brief that CalPRO will be coming out with within the next couple of weeks. So if you aren't on our listserv already, please keep an eye out for that. It will be in our, um, and keep an eye on our website. And if you'd like to join our listserv, please email CalPRO. The email address will be towards the end of the webinar so that we can get you on a listserv and you can get access to that webinar. So let's go ahead and get started and talk about what the research says and what are some actions towards equity that we've seen that individuals within California and you all that are here with us can do in order to further that. So first, I want to mention that on with me today is my awesome co-author and wonderful colleague, Veronica Parker. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Sudi Whalen. I'm the Deputy Director of CalPRO. I'm a Senior Technical Assistance Consultant with American Institutes for Research. And on with me is Ms. Veronica Parker. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, thank you for being in community with us um, during this moment of tragedy, um, as Sudi has pointed out. And of course, my name is Veronica Parker, and I'm the coordinator with the California Adult Education Program Technical Assistance Project. Thank you, Veronica. So I want to know who's on with us. So if you could put into the chat, um, where are you joining us from and what's your role at your agency? Some of you I recognize and I've seen your names before. Um, Carolyn, hello. Paulina, hello. Melissa, hello. Sue. Some of you I don't know. Oh, I recognize Kathy Farwell, but I don't know Faith. Hi, Faith. Um, Carlene, Christy, and hello, everyone. Angela, welcome. Susan, welcome. Oh, Lance, I didn't even see you, and you're right next to me. Hey, Lance. Um, Paulina is with Escondido, which is an ESL teacher. Thank you. So tell us who's here with us, and where do you, what is your role at your agency? Lynn's from Palo Alto. Awesome. ESL program manager. Welcome, Lynn. Christy, Ukiah Adult School. Welcome, Christy. Lance, B. Pace. Teacher on special assignment. Welcome, Lance. Carolyn, ESL program chair at San Diego, ah, San Diego College of Continuing Education. I don't know why I messed that up. Sorry, Carolyn. Uh, Melissa McCarthy, principal at um, Venice Skills Center. Hello, Melissa. Liliana Canes. I hope I said that right. Please tell me if I didn't. Um, CDCR academic coach for our southern region out here. Wonderful. Liliana, nice to meet you. Um, Faith is with Highlands Community Charter School and a multi-subject high school teacher. Fabulous. Sue Oakland, semi-retired. She's trying to retire, but we keep pulling Sue back in. <laughs> Angela Rodriguez, Elk Grove Principal, Community Education. Wonderful. Carlene is North Region Academic Coach for CDC. Oh, I do know Carlene. My bad, Carlene. Took me a second to connect those dots. Um, Kathy is UC Berkeley Extended um, Teacher Credentialing Program. Um, I knew Kathy before she was at UC Berkeley a long time ago. Hi, Angela. Thank you for joining us on camera. All right. So thank you for introducing yourselves and joining us in the chat. Um, so let's continue on and talk about why we're here today. So what we're hoping that by the end of this webinar, that you'll be able to kind of understand the historical context of inequities in adult education at large and in California adult education specifically, um, identify some of the adult education populations and demographics within California, um, understand the impact of inequity on society as a whole, and then I'll also be able to articulate some actionable activities to further equity at your school site. So when we're getting into defining equity and understanding equity, I just want to make sure we have are speaking a shared language that when we're thinking about equity, we're thinking about educational equity as something that is achieved when all students receive the resources, opportunities, skills, and knowledge that they need to succeed in our democratic society. That's what we're talking about. So before we get further along, I'm going to pass this over to, um, to Veronica because she's going to share with us the historical context of inequity within our society. All right. Thank you so much, Sudi. So we're going to um, start this conversation on the historical context of inequity by addressing anti-literacy laws. And so um, next slide, please. Okay, so anti-literacy laws, it made it illegal for enslaved and free people to, of color to read or write. And so in Southern states, 
anti-literacy laws were enacted between 1740 and 1834, and again, prohibiting anyone from teaching enslaved and free people of color to read or write. And so historically, Black people were not allowed to read, write, or even own a book because of these anti-literacy laws. And when we think about anti-literacy laws, they were used as a mechanism to disempower free and formerly enslaved Black people. Black people and keep them marginalized because their education was considered a threat to those in position of power. However, free Black people valued education and pursued it even when it was considered a crime against them or when it was, if caught, they could be harm could be caused um, towards them. So for free and Black people, the attainment of education and skills, that was a revolutionary act, according to historian Clarence Walker, because it gave people the skills and tools needed to combat racism and oppression. And so with the assistance of white allies, free Black individuals created their own schools in order to receive education, to learn how to read, to learn how to write, and etc. So in addition to um, anti-literacy laws, we also have immigration and assimilation. So for immigration and assimilation, just like with anti-literacy laws, there were exclusionary laws that negatively impacted Mexicans, Asians, and others. And so immigrants were forced to assimilate to American culture when they arrived at, in our country and instead of integrating their own country. They were largely focused on English-only education and Anglo-American traditions. However, just like with Black people, immigrants continued to speak their native languages, especially if they were a part of multilingual communities. And that was a way for them to preserve not only their um, traditions, but also their culture as they were becoming American citizens. And so we're um, moving forward. There were some um, history changing legislative acts. So starting with the Bilingual Education Act of 1968. 1968. So starting in 1967, a senator by the name of Ralph Yarborough of Texas introduced this bill, which was proposed to assist school districts in Anish of, as a native language, the teaching of English as a second language, and programs designed to give Spanish-speaking students an appreciation of their ancestral language and culture. So this, this particular bill led to the introduction of 37 other bills that were merged into a single measure known as Title VII of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, or the Bilingual Education Act, which was enacted in 1968. So this bill initially, it was seen as a remedy for civil rights violations. However, it also began the process of formally recognizing that ethnic minorities um, could seek differentiated services for reasons other than segregation or racial discrimination. But most significantly, it encouraged the instruction in a language other than English as a way to build cultural awareness. So next we have, um, in terms of legislation, we have the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. So this law was, um, this act was signed into law on July 26, 1990 by Pre President George W. Bush. And the ADA Act um, is one of America's most comprehensive pieces of civil rights legislation that prohibits discrimination and guarantees that people with disabilities have the same opportunities as everyone else to participate in mainstream American life. And then next we have um, a ruling. So we have Brown versus Board of Education um, in 1954. So the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that school segregation based on race was unconstitutional. Although it did not specifically mention Hispanics or other ethnic minorities, the ruling stated that it also applied to other similar, similarly situated. So while this ruling did not affect the education of non-English speaking minorities directly, it also introduced a new era of American civil rights and the way um, the subsequent legislation would create programs for those who are disadvantaged. So these are just a few uh, pieces of legislation and a ruling that demonstrates how our history began, began to change um, some of um, that brought upon some inclusion in our American society. So the next um, area we're going to talk about is the Furian 
influence, and please excuse me for mispronunciation, but um, this, this quote um, brought to us by, uh, I think it's she, Sweetie? <laughs> Uh, shy. For, shy, sorry, furious. <laughs> so the quote is, uh, Furry's main concern is how to educate people to emancipate themselves from the culture of silence and to meet the needs of humanity and to develop a more just society. So what that means is up until the Furian influence, adult education and workforce were assimilation focused. However, with this particular influence, it forced adult education to move away from just assimilation and more towards freedom by engaging engaging adult learners in critical thinking, in problem solving, in addressing issues of social justice, and more. So this was one way in which we moved towards having an inclusive environment in adult education specifically. So then we, um, we began to also think about California legislation to address some of the inequities. So starting with AB 60 driver's license. So Governor Brown signed AB 60 into law in 2013. And this law directed the Department of Motor Vehicles or DMV to issue a driver's license to anyone who is eligible in the state of California, regardless of their immigration, immigration status. So that means those who are undocumented, they are able to apply for a driver's license and be able to receive it as well. And, then and Veronica, I want to add for the for AB 60 also, that impacts um, our adult learners access to workforce because some jobs require a driver's license. And if you can't get a driver's license, you can't work. So that legislation directly impacted our learners as well. Thank you, Sudi. And then we have um, SB, excuse me, SB 1159. And so that offers professional licenses to anyone who completes the necessary training and other state licenses required requirements regardless of immigration status. So applicants without a social security number in particular could, uh, could apply for professional licenses um, if they had an individual tax identification number when they were seeking a license. So just as Sudi mentioned, you know, our adult learners now have access to obtain some of those professional licenses that they need in order to obtain gainful employment. And then the next um, legislative um, piece of legislation is the installation of a director of immigrant integration, which took place in 2016. So in 2016, California legislator passed a law creating the position director of immigrant integration in the governor's office by way of being able to coordinate immigrant immigrant services and monitor the implementation of immigration assistance programs. So, you know, instead of having um, immigration services and um, assistance program embedded into some other office within, let's say, government, there is now a, an individual who is charged with, you know, having an office of its own when it comes to immigrant integration. And then we have the Immigrant Integration Framework, which was published in 2017. And so the Immigrant Integration um, uh, Framework was published in uh, spring 2016 by um, allies in the South Bay Adult Education, the South Bay Consortium for Adult Education. And this framework was brought together in recognition that there was a need to study how different systems supporting immigrants might be able to work together differently and more effectively and efficiently. So the overarching idea with this immigration, this immigrant integration framework was um, the language act that language acquisition alone, even if it's tracked along with career pathways was insufficient to meet the needs of our immigrants. And so there was an opportunity for a stakeholder group to come together to design this immigrant integration framework. And so this particular framework is a high level system map and it's a representation of the necessary and possible education, economic, excuse me, educational support service um, in work slash community activities leading immigrant integration, addressing linguistic, economic, and civic integration into our society. And it also offers a vision of immigrant integration that can be shared across different stakeholders groups from education to support services to public agencies, so on and so forth. So it's a more holistic approach to be able to meet the needs of our immigrants by utilizing this framework. And so with this framework came the um, AB 2098 Immigrant Integration Measures and Data Collection, which came about in 2018. And so this um, data, this new way of uh, data collection, it was a way to document California adult education contributions to immigrants and their 
also by extension, their families, communities, and the state as a whole. So now we have data collection uh, measures in place where we are able to see the work that's being done in adult education to meet the needs of our immigrants. So those are the ways in which um, the history of inequities um, came about. We talked about you know, the historical context and then the ways in which we're moving towards creating a more equitable and inclusive society in adult education specifically. So now I'll turn it over to Sudi who will talk to us about our adult education population. Thank you so much, Veronica. Really quick, I want to pause though. Does anybody have any questions for Veronica in relation to the legislation, the history, or any of the research, the Frarian approach, or anything else that she mentioned? I know it was a lot, but um, and once the brief is out in a couple of weeks, you'll be able to read in a lot more detail of exactly what she's talking about. Um, but any questions? Go ahead, Melissa. Hi, Veronica. Hi, Sudi. I have a quick question. I was just wondering that data that's collected statewide, um, how do we, is that through the CASA system or what is the, what is the instrument they're using to collect that data? So it is CASAS. Um, there are the I-3 reports in CASAS. Um, that is used to track this, um, this data, the immigrant integration data. Thank you, Veronica. Other questions? Alrighty, so I'm going to move us forward into our demographics of California. But before I jump in, I'm going to ask questions so I can see, like, you know, what are our assumptions and does, does the data match our assumptions? So before we jump in, in terms of race, what do you think is the largest demographic in the state of California by percentage? Just in terms of race, whole population, what do you think is the largest demographic in California? And just go ahead and put it into the chat, please. Latina, Liliana says. Latinx. Melissa says white. All righty, so we got a couple of guesses in there. I hope nobody was betting on this. Um, so Melissa's actually right. The largest demographic in California is white. We are 61.6% white according to our census in 2020. Now let's take into account, we all know that back in 20, 2019 and 20 and those kinds of times we we're trying to prep everybody for the census. We had a lot of students who didn't want to do the census because we were, they were worried about immigration status and things like that. But based on the data available, it looks like our population is largely majority white in California. We also have to remember that within the, Cal the state of California, there are huge swaths of the state that are predominantly white that don't have a lot of diversity. Um, if we're not talking about the, the Bay, Northern Bay, Southern Bay, LA Basin area, those kinds of things. So um, yeah, California is predominantly white. Okay, so now think about this a little further. In terms of race, what do you think is the largest demographic in adult education students in California? What do you think is the largest demographic of our student population in terms of race? Faith, I don't know if that was from earlier just now. Welcome, Brian. Melissa says Latino, Hispanic, Hispanic. Latino, Angeles is white. Interesting. Most, we had, there's a one outlier again. So let's see who's right, okay? So if we're looking at our student demographics, according to the national reporting system, our student demographics are 67.19% Hispanic or Latino. And that is, so whoever answered that, pat yourself on the back, you got that one right. Um, and that it's important for us to identify the differences between our state population and our student population. The reason I say that is because not only within California, but in most states, the adult education population does not mirror the statewide population. And what that tells us is that the population we serve may not necessarily look like the population we interact with the most. That also means that we have to understand that our lived experiences may not be the same as our students' lived experiences. So it's good to, to kind of know that you might live in maybe a predominantly white area, but teach in a predominantly Latino or Asian area um, or things like that. Looking a little bit deeper, if we're looking at our California demographics, um, our adult ed demographics, we are 0.35% American Indian or Alaskan Native, 12.78% Asian, 6.31% Black or African American, 67.19% Hispanic or Latino, 
20.23% Native Hawaiian um, or other Pacific Islander, 10.58% white, and 2.55% more than one race. But if we look at our state demographics, it's really different, isn't it? They don't look anything alike. Our state demographics were at 61.6% white, whereas we're at 12.4 black alone, 18.7 Hispanic, 6% Asian alone, 1.1% American Indian Alaska Native, 2% Native Hawaiian, 8.4% some other race, and 10.2% two or more races. So when we think about our demographics, our student population demographics look a lot different than our state demographics. Now let's take it a step further. In terms of gender, what do you think is the largest demographic in California? In California adult ed, I should say, adult ed. No more statewide gotcha questions, I promise. Melissa says women, Lisa says female, Lisa, I think it's Lisa. Um, Ma oh, Diana said male, Faith said female, Kira said female, Brian said female. There's always one outlier every time. Okay, so let's see what, what the right answer is here. It's females. Females make up 62% of our adult education population and 38% of our adult ed population are males. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's what our population looks like in terms of gender identity that's available. So let's take us a step further in here. How many students do you think are served by California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation within California, um, California's corrections ed system statewide how many students do you think they serve? Just take a wild guess. I'll give you a hint, it's in the thousands. So if you guess hundreds, you're way off the mark. It's in a lot of thousands, a little extra hint. <laughs> Brian said girl power. Faith said 50. <sighs> Somebody's looked at, there's no way you just knew that off the top of your head unless you read, read this before. Melissa said 200,000. That was really a guess, Faith? Okay, all right. <laughs> oh, you did know? <laughs> Okay. So, all right. So Melissa said 20,000. Faith said 50,000. Faith is 100% right. She's kind of on a roll. Lucky we were not playing this for money. Um, but yes, California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation serves more than 50,000 adult education students annually. 50,000. As of 2017, African Americans remain the most overrepresented group in California's prison population, with 28.5% of the male population and 25.9% of the female population. That same demographic group only makes up 5.6% and 5.7% of the state population, respectively. And before you start going on, you start to think or consider, hopefully nobody is, that's because Black people commit more crime. It's actually not true. There have been so many studies, and I see Faith, <laughs> Faith is like, that's not true. I know, right, Faith? There have been a lot of studies by the Department of Justice um, and so many others within the state and at the federal level that have indicated that Black people do not actually commit crime at a greater rate than other demographic groups, but they are incarcerated more frequently, they are charged more frequently, and they receive heavier sentences. So until that whole system is fixed, there's nothing we can do about that. But thankfully, for the system that does exist, we have amazing corrections education teachers and leads that are helping these students that are in this population. And I also want to point out really quickly, this image over here is an actual picture from a recent college graduation that took place at um, California State Prison, LA County, also known as LAC. And these students were graduating from Cal State LA. So just know college graduations, high school graduations, all kinds of things are happening within corrections. And so I wanted to make sure we don't leave off that demographic. They are included in our research brief and we are including them here too, because they are a part of our population. Now, I also want to acknowledge that there are some data gaps. There are some things that we don't know. There's no publicly available data that tells us the total number of students with disabilities, physical or learning disabilities. There's no publicly available data that tells us the number of LGBTQIA plus students. And we also don't know the number of non-binary students and transgender students who have not legally changed their gender. And the reason for this is because these are all things that are typically self-disclosed. Therefore, we do not capture data on them in most cases. And so, but I will say this, as in individual institutions, even though this is not reported data and things like that, and we know there are some things that have to be self-disclosed, like students with learning disabilities. We can't just come out and ask them, right? But there are some things we can ask students about. So when we're doing our forms and things like that, welcoming students to our program, getting them to fill in their orientation forms, we can also we can ask them two questions. We can ask them not only 
what is your sex, male or female, because the government makes us collect this data, but what are your preferred pronouns? What gender do you identify as? Those kinds of things. Um, we can ask students if they have a physical disability that need, requires accommodation. Do you need to be seated near a window? Do you need to be sitting near a door? Do you need to have, do we have appropriate ramps and things like that so our students can access things, things of that nature? I think it's important for us, even though we don't know how many students that we serve in California that fall into any one of these three categories for us to acknowledge that they do exist and that we're that we are serving the students and making sure that we are accessible and inclusive wherever we can be and that there's nothing that would deter students from wanting to come into our campuses because they fall under any one of these three areas. Um, and then I also want to mention we don't really get into it in the research brief, but ageism is definitely a thing even within adult education. We see sometimes that some Older students are not offered career pathways because we don't think they'll be able to get jobs and things like that. Um, and when we have job placement and we have job matching, we can actually overcome that. And then we also see sometimes where younger adults are not necessarily included in the equation because they're only 21 or 22. Um, so just remember our adult education population ranges from 18 years old. In some cases, it can be 16, 17, depending on your district structure, um, all the way through till forever. Um, so that's all of our population, so it's important to think about all of them. All righty, so with that being said, I'm going to turn this over to Veronica to talk about the impact on society of inequity. Thank you, Sudi. So when we think about the impact of inequity, we're thinking about two different types of impact, one being on individuals and one being on the economy or um, economic impact. So let's talk about the impact on individuals. So on the next slide, um, we have a list of educational of a list of ways in which educational inequity leads to economic inequality. And so, um, according to RJ Torico in 2018, there is a self perpetuating cycle, and this cycle it demonstrates how any inequities in education are connected to career reduced career opportunities. Uh, lower earning capacity and economic inequality. And so as Sudi mentioned, for the research brief that's coming out, um, you'll see that research shows us that, of course, we may know adults without access to adequate education, you know, basic skills such as reading, writing, and math, and specific job-related skills, they have reduced career opportunities because certain jobs require that you have a certain level of education or that you have a certain skill set, whether it's a broad skill set or a very specific skill set. And so without these different tools, then they do not have access to those particular jobs. Um, and so some of the examples are, as I mentioned, reduced career opportunities, including finding suitable employment, um, long periods of unemployment, especially when we think about the recession um, period, being able to pick up employment, let's say if someone has been laid off. Also low end and entry level jobs with little opportunity for advancement. So being you know complacent in a particular job because that's all you have access to. Low job satisfaction. So thinking about you know the idea of wanting to advance and wanting to grow professionally, but not being able to because you're stuck in this job, that could lead to low job satisfaction, as well as low wages and benefits. So when we think about, especially during this time, a time of inflation, our um, adult learners or society in general, if they do not have access to higher wages um, and benefits, then they could be greatly suffering because of inflation as we are seeing right now. And then a greater likelihood of job termination or layoffs when faced with, let's say, budget cuts, for example. So without educational attainment, it leads to economic inequality. So on the next slide, we talk about the economic impact. Um, Veronica, I just want to pause really quickly on the greater likelihood of job termination. Um, because we think of when we think about the inequities of education and lack of, of education, how that impacts us potentially being able to get laid off or someone getting laid off. The fact of the matter is, if there are budget cuts, if like Veronica just mentioned, every the the powers that be go for the people who are the less qualified and who they feel are the most dispensable. And those tend to most often be the lowest educated and the minority groups. And so that's part of the reason why we included this here because there is a statistical point that says that if you are not higher educated and if you are in a minority group, you are more likely to be laid off or terminated to, due to no fault of your own. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
Thank you, Sudi. And then the economic impact. So when we think about um, those who have lower um, earning capacity, that leads to economic in inequality, which means that a family will not be able to meet their basic needs because they do not have enough resources in order to do so. And so when thinking about that, um, as stated in the brief, research shows that an estimated 48 million people in the United States, including 23.9 million children, live on the threshold of poverty. And that's even despite having at least one family member who works full time, gainfully employed, work year round, but they still do not have the means to of poverty. But one thing that we do know is that access to adult education services and being able to increase um, education, their education levels, as well as uh, career attainment, we provide that access through adult education. So that's one of the ways in which we can combat the inequities on individuals as well as on our economy. So I'll turn it back to Sudi, who will talk to us about actions that we can take towards equity. Before we get into my show and tell section, as I like to call it, um, I would just want to pause and see, did you guys have any questions, guys and gals, did you all have any questions about um, the demographic groups in California or about the economic impact for our students and for society in terms of inequities? No? Okay, all right. So let's talk about, let's get to my show and tell section. Let's talk about actions towards equity. So when you get the research brief, you'll find that there are throughout the brief, um, multiple action steps. And this is the first time CalPro has done this with a research brief. Normally we just prevent the information, let you read it and do with it what you will. However, this time we thought it was important to be intentional and give people action items that they can use so that you're not just reading it and feeling a sense of despair in the first half. And then you get to see some examples of what people did and be like, that's nice for them, <laughs> but actually giving you some tools so that you can do some of the same things that the agencies that are featured in the brief actually did. So First off, before we even begin the brief, we ask that those who are reading it take a quick moment to just visualize who comes to mind when thinking about equity, whether it's all of their students or some specific population, because it's important to think about who are we talking about when we're thinking about inequity and when we're thinking about making things more equitable. Who are we doing this for and why does it matter to us, right? So I want to actually, oh, you're welcome, Carolyn. Um, so I want to ask all of you really quickly, when you think about equity, who comes into your mind? What groups, individuals, and it might not even be a group. Maybe there's one person from years ago that you taught that you wish you had, that more had been done for and the system didn't allow it. And that's the person who made you want to try to change things. Maybe it's a whole group of people. Maybe it's all of your students. Maybe it's a particular demographic of students. What comes to your mind or who comes to your mind in terms of groups when you think about, in, about equity and wanting to address it? When you think of the word equity, who comes into your mind? English learning development, English language learner students. Thank you, Liliana. Yeah. And they are largely impacted by inequities in our society. Lance said when he thinks about inequity, he thinks about students who they serve, particularly his ABE and, and HSS students and his ESL students. Christy says, the person who can't see over the fence to watch the ball game, right? That graphic just kind of burns into our brains. Yeah, exactly. I think about a CTE student I had once. I'm going to tell you a quick story while you guys are typing in who you think about. I had a student who had finished multiple programs in our CTE. Like she did all of our medical programs, did our accounting program. And I was like, girl, I have so many job placements. I can get you in right now. Like there's this thing at Kaiser. This is how much they'll pay you. And she said, I don't think I really know if I want to work at Kaiser. And I was like, well, why? And she said, well, I don't want to make too much money. And I said, well, what happens if you make too much money? She's like, well, they'll take away my benefits. And for me, I was like, what, why would you wanna stay on benefits? But then she explained to me that when she was younger, her mom had gotten a really great job and they had been on benefits. And so they came off benefits because her mom made too much money. She had a good job and they were doing really well. And then her mom got fired and they ended up being homeless her junior and senior year of high school. And she promised herself she would never do that to her kids. So she was afraid to get off of benefits because she was worried that if she did, that she wouldn't be able to support her kids anymore. 
And I think about her because I think about when I think about equity in education, I think about inequities in workforce also, right? And I think about systems in place that don't necessarily help us get better, but are kind of structured to keep us where we are, right? And I think about how she decided after a couple of conversations with me to apply for the job. She got the job. She makes way more money than I do now. And she's doing amazing. But when I think about inequity, she always pops into my head because I think about how can we make things better for people. So I wanna turn into um, what some of you all said in here. Um, Carlene said the 70, 70 year old who learned to read this year. Oh, I love that. Melissa says students that can't make a livable income to stay in California, yes. Veronica said all stakeholders, including learners, educators, community members, and more. Learners are the most impacted. However, everyone has everyone else has a role to implementing actions to eradicate inequities. Yes, Veronica Preach. Uh, Diana said students and students with disabilities who are so often overlooked. Thank you, Diana, for putting them in there. Brian said lower sexual lower socioeconomic of all races. Great. Um, yeah, because we also have to think about when we're thinking about inequities, we're not only talking about race, we're talking about all the areas that inequities exist, which do include those who are in socio and socioeconomic demographics, that are in rural areas that are living in poverty, that don't have access. There are so many facets to equity aside from race and ethnicity. And I'm not saying race and ethnicity don't matter, but it's only one factor a lot among a lot of them. Um, Liz said, um, is it Lisa or Lisa? I hope I'm saying, is it Lisa? I'm going to say Lisa. It's, Lisa. it's Lisa. You're, you're saying it perfectly. Thank Lisa, you. thank you, Lisa. <laughs> I always feel bad about mispronouncing people's names. Um, she said locally in their ESL program, it's the low SES and or Hispanic population. They're 25% of the population we serve, but not reflected in their community. Yes. Thank you all so much for those honest and heartfelt thoughts of who you, comes to mind for you when you think about equity. So let's look at action step number two. Part of action step number two is just to simply learn more about your population within your community and your demographics. So the link that we've included in the research brief is to the census. Um, and so what's really cool about the census, like I recently moved from California to Portsmouth, Virginia, because my mommy's here and I needed my mom. I'm sorry, I'm still a mama's girl. Um, but I lived in California for well over a decade and it's my adult at home. So I still think about things in terms of California. So when I'm thinking about census data and I'm thinking about California, I could literally just type in the city that I did lived in when I was doing most of my adult education work. And I taught at um, Liberty Adult Ed in Brentwood. So I'm going to put in Brentwood, California. There we go. The city, not the suburb. It's important to note this is not in Southern California. Um, and so when I do that, I can get access to so much information, race, ed, age, sex, so many different types of things, population over 65. And the more you dive into this and you can look at the independent tables and stuff like that, you can figure out things about their languages, so much information here that's available to you at your fingertips just to find out more about your local population. Um, so it's really cool to have access to this and to utilize that information. And another thing you can do to take that a step further is compare your census data information with your CASAS information, if you're using CASAS or NOVA, if you're in NOVA, and just compare and see, does my demographic group that I'm serving actually look like my community? And if it doesn't look like my community, figure out, and I'm talking about the community the school is in, not necessarily where you live, the community where your school is in. Um, and if you're realizing that your demographic population doesn't really match that of the community the school is in, then your question should be why? Is it because we're not actually reaching the students within that community? Or is it because we're pulling people from outside the community in and thinking about how can we not only pull people from outside the community, but how can we meet the needs of those within the community? I was talking to someone a couple of weeks ago, I think I told Veronica this story, and she looked at her census data information and realized the most common language other than English spoken in her neighborhood and the neighborhood their school was in was Tagalog. But they did all of their flyers in English and Spanish. And then she was like, I've been doing flyers in Spanish all this time. And we don't actually have that high of a population of Spanish speakers in this that, that we're serving. And so she was like, I realize now that I need to get this translated into Tagalog so my students can actually, the people in the community can actually read what we're marketing and maybe we can get more students in. So like little things like that, um, looking at the census can actually help you identify best marketing strategies, things like that. You can take it a step further and do some community asset, market, um, community asset mapping. 
Veronica um, on the Cape Tap website. There's a couple of re webinar recordings that explain community asset mapping and things like that. Feel free to grab that. And also, if you, um, Laura is popping the links into the chat. So if you're trying to access the direct link to census, just click that link in the chat. It will be there for you. Alrighty, and then action step number three is if you're a teacher and you're wondering if your classroom is inclusive of the student students that you're serving, you can take an inclusive classroom self-assessment. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So this is our inclusive class, um, classroom self-assessment um, self developed by Turner Consulting Group. It is fantastic because it looks at a lot of different pieces of inclusivity. And then it asks you to kind of reflect on things that you don't do at all, what do you do really well, and what do you do extremely well, right? Um, and this is something that when you do this inclusive classroom self-assessment, and I want to point out for this one and the other self-assessment, I'm going to show you in a minute. This is not something I recommend doing with a group. You can ask a group to do it, but I don't recommend necessarily sharing your results unless you're actually ready to do so. And the reason I say that is because you might identify an area of growth that you might be kind of embarrassed by, or if you're an administrator and you ask somebody to do this and have a growing moment, you don't want to collect that and then penalize somebody for trying to grow, right? So it's okay to ask people to complete these type of assessments and things like that, and even ask them to pick an action item based on their self-assessment. But please don't ask them to turn in their self-assessments to you. People will not honestly answer the questions if you do that, and we don't want this to be a punishment tool. It needs to be a tool used for learning and growth. Um, thank you, Veronica, for tapping for top, putting that into the chat. If you're interested in the community asset mapping, which takes you a step further than census data, um, that is available to you too. So this inclusion, um, this this is really great. What I like the most about it is the competencies and the questions that are go fall under specific competencies. Like competency one is self reflection to increase our own self awareness. Competency two is creating an inclusive classroom. And what does that look like? Creating an inclusive learning environment, which isn't quite the same as a classroom. And then also thinking about increasing understanding and improving your interactions with students um, and then becoming more culturally competent in that way. And then increasing understanding and improving interactions with the school community. So for example, if your school is within a predominantly Hispanic community, but you're not able to interact with those within your community, you want to think of ways that you can do that and so that you can become as educators, as administrators, as school programs, part of that community. Um, and then you'll be fine that typically if you're really well embedded with your community, the community helps send students to you because they think you're great. Um, and then lastly is competency number six, which is the um, actively promoting equity, diversity, and inclusion in all schools and communities. And there's been a couple of different um, versions of the DEI acronym. There's diversity, equity, inclusion. There's DEIA, um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. There's DEIB, which adds in belonging, those kinds of things. But they all kind of get to the same point, which is thinking of being actually accessible and inclusive of all students. Um, so that is also the second link that um, Laura popped into the chat there, the inclusive classroom self-assessment for educators. The next action step is about cultural competence. And for those who have not gone to our multiple webinars that we've had, this is the third and last of our three-part series. Of, we talked about cultural competence previously, but cultural, the culturally competent continuum basically gets us from, I have a t-shirt that says that, Melissa. Um, the cultural competence continuum brings us from cultural destructiveness, incompetence, blindness, pre-competence, um, competence, and then proficiency. An agency cannot be culturally proficient if their staff is not all culturally competent. And that means we understand what it means to be different. We understand what, the, what, that, what a difference that difference makes. And we respond to that appropriately and affirmingly. We completely acknowledge and champion embracing various cultures. And not just only on cultural heritage days and things like that, but in general, when we think about the text that we display, when we think about what we put on our classrooms, when we think about the examples and the literature and all of that stuff, we're thinking about being multicultural because our students are multicultural. That also means thinking about religious holidays and things like that. We, we try not to host tests on days that might be um, religious observation days if students are Muslim, if they're Jewish, if they're, regardless of what their religion may be. Um, we think about those cultural holidays. And there actually are a million websites that list all the cultural holidays that you could try to avoid and things like that. And if they're completely unavoidable, not penalizing students for their religion if they can't come to class that day and giving them an alternate method for actually being able to complete an assessment or something like that that's required. So the cultural competence self-assessment looks like this. 
And this is made by a great group out of Canada called Rap Workers, which they work with a lot of refugee groups and things like that. Out of all of these checklists, this is like one of the best ones that I have found. And they gave us permission to recreate it for a lot of good questions in this checklist. So if you haven't seen this before, take some time to go into it. Some of the things that they ask you really seem very simple, but when you think about it deeply, like I gain from my mistakes, do I? Or do I get defensive? I'm going to be honest, sometimes I get defensive, Um, but I'm trying to learn and grow. Um, But thinking about that, asking questions, um, you know, those things, I will really listen to the answers before asking another question. And while you might think that's not really related to being culturally confident, when you read all the questions, you'll understand how these things connect when we're no longer making assumptions by our students, but asking them for clarity and making sure we're actually being receptive to what they're saying to us. So a very, very great tool. Action step number five. And this one's a little hard, little trickier. Um, this is the um, taking an implicit association test. And there are a number of them. But what I want to say about IATs or implicit association tests is that implicit association tests are can change depending on your lived experience. So for example, if I did an implicit association test today about, let's say, males, I could come out and be, and it could show I have zero bias whatsoever today because I haven't had a negative experience with any males today. Now, say I take the same assessment a month from now after some, let's say a random male yells at me at the gas station because I didn't move fast enough. I might suddenly be like, men are terrible with it internally and then do that same assessment and come out showing a bias, right? And so what that also tells us is on the flip side, when you have a positive interaction with demographic groups, that can also change your IAT results to re- to show less bias. So if I say I had that negative interaction with a male, but then another male came up and told that male off, I might be like, chivalry's not dead. Some guys are great. Um, and I might not show a bias. So that was just a really wild kind of example. But the point is, if you take an implicit association test and it shows that, for example, you have a bias towards people with tattoos and stuff like that, and then you go and then you interact with more people with tattoos, you'll notice that that bias dissipates. And if you go back and redo that assessment, you'll see that that assessment result has changed over time. So I do want to caution you there. But what I like about the implicit association test is that there are so many of them that if you're not even sure if you have any kind of bias or whatever, it's a great opportunity to just kind of play around with this. When I first learned about the IATs, there weren't this many at the time, like the politics one didn't exist and the the president's one wasn't a thing, stuff like that. But there were a few of them in there and I felt like I was rocking it. I did all of these implicit association tests. I'm like, look at me, I don't have any bias because I am awesome. And then I got to the gender one and it was like, you have a bias towards males. And I was like, but I have a dad that I adore. And I like my husband, he's great. And my sons are amazing. And my brother's my BFF, what do you mean? Um, But then I started really internalizing, like I stayed up, I could not sleep, it bothered me so much. And so I started really thinking about, was that integrating into my work in some way? And if you were at our previous two webinars, you probably heard the story already. Um, But what I found was, I started looking at our marketing material and I was super intentional and I used to lead a CT department with making sure that we had females and all of our male dominated stuff. There was females in woodworking, females in auto mechanic. I made sure we had female representation. But ask me if I put any males in our female dominated careers. I did not. And that was when I noticed where my bias was actually in- indicated within the work that I was doing. And so I can't sit there and ask myself, how come we don't have any males in this program when I'm not marketing to them, when I'm not including them in any of the imagery? If I'm a male and I see that, I'm going to assume that this is a female only class and there's not going to be anybody who looks like me in that class. And if I'm trying to change that, I need to include males in the marketing. So thankfully, my boss at the time, Debbie Norgard, was amazing and let me add some males into our marketing material. And we did actually get some males in those programs. But it was a wake-up moment for me because I realized that even I had bias I didn't realize I had and it was impacting my work and it could have been impacting potential students and so I had to make a change so anyway there's a lot of them you can do on here Um, you can do so many different ones whether about weight skin tone age race religion transgender gender sciences weapons presidents I wouldn't dive into the president's one that one just seems kind of sad but you know do whatever you want (laughs) I just try to stay out of the political scope of stuff altogether and just stick with what actually matters. Um, So there's that. And then the last one, not that presidents don't matter. They do. I'm not saying they don't. I vote. Don't worry. All righty. So then action step number six, 
If you want to investigate equity and access at your agency, and if you when you get the research brief and read it, you'll see where some people in LAUSD, Los Angeles Regional Adult Ed Consortium, things like that, we're super intentional with trying to peel back. We do what we call peeling back the wallpaper and dig deeply to figure out where inequities lie. And there is a really simple tool that we have that allows us to kind of help with that. Um, and so you can access that from our CalPRO website. And so this, this tool, what it does is it kind of gets you, first of all, spurring the conversation about who has access to these things. And that means you have to kind of look beyond the surface level data. And when we say peeling back the wallpaper, the reason we call it that is because sometimes the wallpaper looks really pretty and nice and wonderful. And then you start to peel it back and that's where those inequities are. And it's not as cute under there. That's that old ugly dated green wallpaper that we thought we covered up. And then we peel it back some more and there's even uglier stuff under there. And we have to peel it off and clean it up in order for us to do better, right? And so that's why we use that analogy. But when we're looking at this, we're looking at our policy types and we're looking at um, specific questions. So we give you three examples, but you can take it as far as you want to go with this. But we start with academics, class scheduling, internships, externships, and thinking about who has access to that, who actually uses it, and why do they use it? Who? Why do some people not use it or not participate? Also thinking about What's the participation rate by race, gender, socioeconomic status, or anything else you want to throw in there? Finding out who actually feels supported to access those services, and then finding out who does not feel supported. Now, you want to know how you're going to get most of that information by asking your students. You can first start out looking at your interaction logs and your classes and, your, and your, that kind of data to figure out who's going to these things, who's utilizing these services. But if you really want to figure out the, the why, you have to ask your students. And one of the things that we talk about a lot is getting student information, asking your students, how do they feel? There are a lot of student DEI survey samples and data and things like that that you can pull from the interwebs, take it and make it your own and survey your students. So you can figure out, do they feel supported? Do they have a sense of belonging? Is the reason they didn't go to the internship because they didn't think it was for them and it was for somebody else and, or that they wouldn't be comfortable there or people wouldn't welcome them there? Like, is there a reason why they're not using it? The next one is social emotional supports like counseling, mentors, cultural events, things like that. Who shows up? Who doesn't show up? Why don't they show up? Um, who doesn't feel included? And then college and career. And the reason I had a college and career on here is honestly because a few years ago when we were developing the equity module for CalPRO, one common theme was ESL students not having access to career pathways because a lot of people were assuming they just want to learn English. They don't care about going into careers and colleges. But we really can't say that for sure if we're not asking them. And so that doesn't mean that every ESL student wants to be on a pathway, but it means we do need to be asking them and giving them the opportunities. And so the same information we share with our ABE, our HSC, our CTE students about transitions, pathways, things like that, making that information also available to our ESL students in the event that they actually do want to be part of a career pathway, making sure that we're being equitable with, with job placement, goal setting, and any kind of career pathway, anything. Um, because you know, ESL students tend to get left out of it. In recent years, because IET, especially for IE, IET for ESL students has become very big in California, we've been seeing where more ESL students are getting part of these pathways and we're being a little bit more intentional, but there's a lot more work to do there. So that's why we include that on here. Now, don't, but wait, there's more. Once you do this whole part, you then have to look at further, what additional data do I need in order to get the answers to these questions, right? And then lastly, identifying what the overt inequities are and finding out if there are policies that are connected to those overt inequities. One of the best places to start is attendance policies where students are often penalized because they have a job, kids, and a general a life. And so if we think about ways to make sure students can actually get credit, even if they can't be button seat, online access, other ways to turn things in, flipped classroom, all kinds of things, we can actually serve more students and not penalize them simply for being who they are, okay? So that's the tool there. And so, um, that's, so that's pretty much it. And so if you do, another thing that you can do is host the, and this is the last action step, is host the CalPRO Success for All Learners through equity training, which does teach you how to use that tool, use data to identify inequities in a lot of different types of things, and also gives you opportunities to have conversations around these topics with other individuals within those cohorts. So you can email us at calpro at AIR.org if you would like to host um, this training, or if you would just like to find out when it's going to happen again. So 
I do want to wrap us up letting you know the research brief will be out in June. We're very excited about it. It's called Evidence to Action, Equity in California Adult Education. Um, you learned a lot of stuff that's included in the brief today, but don't forget to read it. There's a lot of extra details in there that we get to cover. Um, I do want to give us a quick minute to find out if we have any questions. Look at us on time, Veronica. We did it for once. <laughs> Usually we go over. Any questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you all so much for being here. I know today's been a hard day for a bunch of us, but I really appreciate you plugging in and joining us and jumping in. Please keep an eye out for that research brief. It'll be out soon. Um, the evaluation link is in the chat. Please do the evaluation. I really appreciate it when you do. Thank you all so much. Have a beautiful day. Thank you, Veronica, for being here as always as a thought partner and co-presenter. And thank you, Laura, for being our tech maven behind the scenes. Have a beautiful rest of the day, everybody. And don't forget to click that link into the email. Thank you.